Well, I'm pleased to be here. It's been some time since I've attended one of these. Um, I've seen a lot of people that I had seen for a while, and glad to see you still standing and with us. Um, and the conversations I had last night and today with a number of you sort of echoed some of the things that I'm going to say today. Um, and I think that, you know, when we start publishing memorials in our uh, newsletters and in our uh, programs like for this meeting, that that's saying something about the organization. But it also means, I think, that these are the things that are bothering you or concerning you, and I've been thinking about it, that it just proves that great minds move in the same vein. And so, uh, what I want to talk about today is the fact that I think that this organization uh, needs to pause and think about not only what it's done up to this point, but lay out some kind of future course. And part of my concern about the future course is that we aren't always in communication as chapters the way we should be. And as a result of that, I may not know what you're doing, you may not know what I'm doing, but from my perspective, it looks as if we've got some lapses that we need to take care of. As somebody's pointed out, this the trail legislation now is 28 years old, and in that time, we've done a good deal of location of routes, marking routes, uh, and without question, there's still a lot to be done there in doing that. Uh, but while that work is being done, and the trail is finally marked and set up and how the National Park Service wants it. Uh, then I think there are some other things that we need to be doing as an organization if we're going to tell the full story of Indian removal. And I want to talk about some of those today. The uh, first thing I would urge is that we get research attention uh, to the removal of the other tribes. Uh, despite the focus of the legislation on the Cherokees, at this point we have managed, uh, certainly in Arkansas, to get some information related to the other tribes, including in the interpretations. And uh, those states, I think, that have uh, sites that are related to more than one tribe uh, need to undertake research to make sure that the information relevant to those other tribes show up in the interpretation. Uh, where interpretation hasn't been done, then I think you've got an opportunity to really do research and to bring those other tribes in. And the states that have those, uh, for the most part, as I can tell, Alabama, Tennessee, and Arkansas, uh, those uh, states for sure. And then where there are common sites on the water routes in Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, Missouri, and Arkansas, that have not been interpreted uh, need to include the other tribes that were on those water routes uh, as well as the Cherokees. Um, now, I think all that needs to be done in not only fairness to the other tribes, but fairness to the general public as well. Uh, I think that particular attention needs to be put uh, on the Muscogee Creeks who moved out of the Cherokee Nation with the Cherokees. And I think that we need to look at those Creek families that were with the Cherokees on those, in those main contingents, like the Danish contingent, for instance. We need to make sure that what interpretation we give recognizes that. Because those Creeks were in the Cherokee Nation uh, after primarily moved in there after the Treaty of 1832 and uh, as a, a response to the push for removal. Now, some of the work can be done when you start replacing the markers that you put up already. 
uh, and I think you will have to replace those. Uh, if you take a look at some of those markers that went up early, you can already tell the effects of weather on those markers, and if you talk to sign makers, uh, they won't guarantee the work that they're doing for uh, a very long time. I think about five years is what most of them would be. Um, we did, uh, went to a, a product called Novaloy. I don't know how many of you know about that, but it is a metal alloy uh, sign that uh, we put up in Trail of Tears Park at our campus for the Choctaws and Chickasaws uh, removal. Uh, and if you look at those signs today, they're just as fresh looking as they were in 2011 when we put them up. So I would urge you to look for some other kind of marker than what we put up at this, to this point because I don't think those are going to last very long. Now, we in Arkansas have the biggest job that any state has. We have more miles of roads and waterways used by all the tribes than the other states. Um, but we have the advantage of legislative authority to mark the routes of the other tribes. The Arkansas legislature passed a uh, Heritage Trails Bill in 2009, and many of the people involved in the Arkansas chapter now, Trail of Tears, were the people who were initially pushing for that uh, up in northwest Arkansas. And it, it came to fruition, and the tribes, the, all the tribes were mentioned in that legislation. So we in Arkansas will be marking in time all of those routes because, for all of those tribes because um, uh, we know the value of what we're doing and we know what that means to the tribes. Um, Research is pretty well underway for the Chickasaws and Choctaws. Uh, we have done some work for the Muscogee Creeks, but we've done practically nothing for the Seminoles. And uh, that's going to change, and it's, it's change is going to start soon. I have an intern who will be starting in January working with me, uh, and we're going to work specifically on Seminole removal through the state. And so, I, my plan is to find interns in the future who are amenable to studying that and work with them to, to get the research done. Now, only as you know from all the markings that this organization has done, the only way you can really get people involved is to get the research done first and find out what happened in a particular landscape, then work with the communities in those landscapes to convince them that they need to put money into the project, energy into the project, or whatever uh, uh, it takes. Um, now, the research question that I would like to see people ask is not just which peoples were at this particular place, but why were they there as well? In other words, it's not enough to, for some kid on a bicycle to ride up and read a sign and learn about a particular tribe moving through this landscape. If that person looking at the sign doesn't have some context into which that fits. And so I think there is where we have failed, basically as a, uh, an organization to get all of that done. Okay, besides working with the other tribes, I think that the second task is um, this organization faces is writing up the results of the research. Now, I've always, I was a teacher writing for 45 years before I stopped teaching and started doing what I'm doing now. Um, and one of the things that I always try to teach my students was that in any research project, the last step is dissemination. How are you going to get this information out to the audience? And we've, we've got the task of putting this information into some form that we can get out to the public. 
Um, now, you know how the old historian, well, older than me, older than I, uh, historians handled this, you know, like, excuse me, Grant Foreman or my old mentor, Angie DeBoe. They would get people to the border of Arkansas and then they'd shoot them out the other side in Indian Territory. And they would say things like, um, you know, they were removed within a certain period of time. Uh, and we've got to, to do more than that in terms of reading that the public has before they come to these signs. Now, if this trail works the way it's supposed to, you're going to have people who start at one end of this thing and go all the way through it. I mean, that's, that's the ideal thing. Uh, and all the states that I know of that are concerned about this talk about cultural tourism, and, and that's an important thing. But what is it they're going to be reading? If they read Foreman and DeBoe, and then go look at these signs, they're going to be looking at two different stories. So what we need to do is to come up with historical treatment of the trails of tears for these tribes that will provide a context that people will have before they get to the point. And we've had uh, recent removal studies of the creeks and the Chickasaws. But where is the riding, the major riding, on these other tribes? You've got more information, research information, at your disposal than most of these historians have had over decades. And, and so, and I, I know what the arguments are. I'm not a writer. You know, I like doing research, but I'm not a writer. But you know people who are. You, you can back up writers by, you know, shared research and that kind of thing. So uh, we need to do something, and I was, I was pleased to look at some of the displays from the chapters. Developing brochure kinds of information, maybe just a broadsheet of information to go with interpretive signs that can provide a background for each particular sign. Now, that's time consuming, it's costly, but I think until we do that, then we're not gonna communicate what we need. Now, it's, it, it's the choice we make about what kind of generation we're gonna have that comes after the present one in understanding Indian removal. Um, I know now if you ask elementary kids and junior high school kids in most schools in Arkansas uh, what tribes were removed, they're all going to say Cherokee. A few might know some other tribe, but they're not going to know all of them. They're not going to know basically why removal took place. Um, and until we get that information into the public school, we're not going to have any change in that attitude. And it's going to be that old standard attitude that we had in historians like Foreman and DeVoe. Now, the tendency has been to fall back on these pat causes for Indian removal. Uh, Andrew Jackson was an Indian agent. <coughs> White Southerners were hungry for more land put in cotton culture. Okay? Those may have been part of the logic, but I don't think those were the primary ones for Indian removal. And I think this is a story that has to be told. I'd like to see this group stop giving Andrew Jackson, the lion's share of blame for passing the Removal Act. Uh, he didn't write the bill. He didn't come up with the idea of removal. Um, that was George's idea. Came up in the Compact of 18-2. And Georgia promised that if the United States would remove the Indians from within its borders, 
they would give up their title to the Western Territories, which became Mississippi and Alabama. Thomas Jefferson the next year bought Louisiana, and he bought it for one specific reason. He bought it for several reasons, but one specific reason was to remove the Indian stick. So he's trying to comply with the Georgia Compact. And then follows a large number of presidents who wrote agreements with the tribes for voluntary removal. And we in Arkansas know that history very well because this is how we got the Western Cherokees the, that later were called the um, Old Settlers. And, and then they were the ones that moved on into Indian territory in 1828. And so those were treaties 1817, 1819 that brought Cherokee people out here in larger numbers. So it wasn't, it wasn't Jackson that wrote that bill. He only signed it. Now, no self-respecting, self-interest politician at that time would have vetoed that bill. And Jackson, that's what he was. Now, you can blame him for the heavy-handed way he underwent negotiating these treaties. He told people like John Coffey and John Eaton, promise the Indians everything and give them nothing. Those were his specific instructions. And you can blame him for that. You can blame him for a whole bevy of low lowlifes that he, his administration appointed to administer Indian rule. People like Terry Harris and William Armstrong and John Coffey. I mean, they were generally unprincipled human beings. And all you got to do is read their correspondence, and you know that. What we need to get into our mindset is the fact that what was moving Andrew Jackson more than anything else at this time was his concern that the South was the most vulnerable area for foreign invasion of the United States. And I don't think in the body of material that I've read about Indian removal, I have seen that as part of the focus, but I think it needs to be there. If you understand that concern he had for foreign invasion, then that helps explain why the Chickasaws and Choctaws were the first that he negotiated removal treaties with. He had fought the British at New Orleans in 1815, whenever it was, 14, 18, yeah. uh, but during the War of 1812. And he thought the lower Mississippi Valley was the most vulnerable spot in the South for invasion. And the Choctaws already had land west of Arkansas when they negotiated that treaty. That was the Treaty of Dogstan, 1820. And I'm not going to go into the history of that, but Arkansas, you know, had these birth and rebirth experiences uh, trying to get that western mine settled. And the Choctaws had to give back some land, and Arkansas had to give up Old Miller County. So, and the Choctaws know the history of Millerton, Oklahoma and Miller County, Arkansas. Now, Chickasaw and Choctaws both had fought with Jackson in New Orleans. And he claimed that they were his friends, but he really didn't trust them. Uh, and he had similar feelings for the Muscogee Creeks and the Florida tribes at the time because of the Spanish influence on those latter two. Now, he fought the Creeks in 1815, and then he had invaded Florida in 1817, what's called the First Seminole War, and that led to the treaty that ceded Florida to the United States in 1821. So he cleared the 
or nations out of the South, but he wanted white American farmers settled in the Gulf area because he, Indians had sided with the foreign powers too often in his lifetime and he did not trust them. And so he was going to get them out at all costs. And one of those costs, and this brings me to the last issue, um, is central to the issue that we call Indian removal and the event we call Trail of Tears. And that's the removal of African descended people with the tribe. Now, I talked to the Arkansas chapter of Trail of Tears uh, in July, I think it was, and I said something basically like uh, to ignore this topic is like trying to ignore an elephant in your living room. Uh, it's there and it needs to be dealt with because it has more to do with Indian removal than, than just some tribes moving slaves to the West. And I'll try to explain that here. Now, you have a mandate to deal with this. And I don't know if you've read the fine print or not, but I'm going to quote to you from the 2006 Senate report to Bill S-1970 that expanded the trail routes for this project. And they gave lip service, and this is what they said. The trail commemorates the forcible removal of more than 16,000 Cherokees, black slaves, and other tribes from their homelands. Now, I hear black slaves and other tribes. My question is, what's been the hang-up for the last 11 years? in both of those issues. Now, I'm not going into the political reasons why I think that those topics have not been dealt with. And I think you know them probably as well as I do. Uh, but I want to look at some of the areas that I think we can focus our research on and do good work for reinterpreting and interpreting new sites. All chapters need to take a second look at Cherokee removal. You need to re-examine these long-standing arguments made by the Cherokees that the slaveholding faction of the Cherokees were the treaty parties. The treaty parties were traitors. They left early and didn't go with Trail of Tears. Now, have you heard that? Or is that just in my imagination? I've heard it. Now, all you gotta do is look at the figures. And that's not true. It's just not true. If you look at the census of 1835, and that tells you the story, and I'm gonna be dealing with some figures here. There were 16,535 Cherokees and 1,592 slaves. The slaves made up 9% of the population. There were 203 slaveholders, most having fewer than 10 slaves. Both Ross and Treaty adherents were substantial slaveholders. And all you've got to do is look at the leadership of the Ross party and the Ridge party. And only Major Ridge and his son John had more than 10 slaves at 15 and 21, respectively. Stan Lady owned one, Elias Boudinot, oh, sorry, Stan Lady owned, owned none, and Elias Boudinot owned one. John Ross held more slaves than Major Ridge, he had 19, and only two less than John Ridge. Lewis Ross owned more than the Ridges combined, 41. George Lowry Sr. owned 20, one more than Major Ridge, and John Martin, the National Treasurer, owned more than the Ridges combined. Look at Ross's Removal Committee of 1838. Ross, Elijah Hicks, Edward Gunner, Samuel Gunner, Sitawaki, White Path, and Richard Taylor. All were privileged slaveholders except Sitawaki and White Path. Now, a majority of the contingent leaders 
and the removal were also slaveholders. Taylor, Bushyhead, Bench, Bell, Brown, Hildebrand, George Hicks, Elijah Hicks, and Moses Daniel. John Drew, who was in the West in 1835, when the census was made, was also a slaveholder. A number of the assistant conductors were slaveholders in 1835 as well. So we have two possibilities here. Either these leaders sold off or manumitted their slaves before they left to the West, or the Cherokee removal was managed by primarily by slaveholders. Yeah. Now, that doesn't fit any of the interpretations I've read so far. Now, without rosters, it's hard to determine that first possibility, whether they manumitted their slaves. So, what I did was look at the, the Ben's contingent. And what I did was I went back and chased the people of that contingent and compared their slaveholding to the number of slaves they had in the, the uh, census of 1835. There were 1,103 people in the Ben's contingent and 144 of those were, were slaves. There were also Creeks with that group. So if you compare the slaveholding members of that contingent for the 1835 census, you'll find very little difference in the number of slaves they held. Some, excuse me, some had one or two more, a few more, others had one or two, a few less than they had in 1835. So I think if, and I didn't look at the other rosters, now that needs to be done, and I may be entirely wrong about this, bench may be a fluke, but you can tell by looking at those rosters if that same kind of comparison would hold true. Now the problem is we only have a limited number of rosters. So that may be a difficult thing to push, but um, it's worth looking at. Yeah. Now, one of the ironies of Cherokee removal is, is that these people who managed the removal were slaveholders, and many of them privileged slaveholders. Now what this meant was that if a Cherokee had a large family and large slave holdings, they didn't have to go into the concentration camps. They stayed at home. And this meant that they could catch up with the removal parties on the road whenever they want to. All you have to do is read the bench record and you, you can see this at work. Uh, there's, there's no way to get around it. And they could go to the boat, but most of them didn't. Most of them commuted. Most of them, the privileged slave owners, did not go over the route, the trail. Now, I've heard another argument. Oh, I guess I should say this. What about those people that weren't privileged slaveholders? They had only one or two or three slaves. Where were they? They didn't turn the slaves loose to run around the woods while they went to the camps. Those slaves were in the camps with the Cherokees. So they didn't escape that part of it. Now, another argument I've heard is that the big slave owners sent their slaves to the West ahead of time. So the slaves could have gone over the Trail of Tears. Well, a large number of slave owners did send their slaves to the West, uh, but it was mainly Ross Party people that did that. Um, but my question is, how did they get to the West? They had to get there the same way anybody traveling to the West had to get there. I mean, you couldn't go to airport Atlanta and catch a plane to Little Rock. I mean, so, to me, that question, or that argument doesn't fit. So, I come to the conclusion that the Treaty Party members were not the largest slaveholders, and that many of those had already gone to the West, taken their slaves with them, uh, before the, the forced removal. 
Most of the African descended people that came over the Trail of Tears with the Cherokees were owned by Cherokees across party. Now, you're going to encounter a problem if you undertake research on this subject. And it's going to be the same problem that you've had with uh, removal of any of these tribes, and that is numbers. How do you get an accurate count of how many people were brought to the West by the tribes? Well, we know that nearly 500 came west with the Seminoles. And there were about 4,500 Seminoles at the time. Uh, best guess among the Creeks is that there were a few more than 500 that came with the Creeks. Now, the Creeks had spent a lot of time in camps. And, and you had all kinds of property losses. You had poverty. Uh, you had slave stealers that raided the camps and so on. And so we know that the Treaty of 1832 numbers are not probably going to be helpful because there was a good deal of attrition uh, in the slave numbers. Uh, the estimated 7,000 Chickasaws had 255 slave owners and brought 1,223 slaves with them. About 500 came with the Choctaws. Now, Choctaws may have better figures than that. And how many came with Cherokees is uncertain. Now, we can, we can go back. We've got practically all the rosters, if not all of them, for the Muscogee Creeks, uh, Seminoles, and Choctaws. So it's possible for us to go back and read those schedules to get accurate count numbers. I just personally have not had time to do that. Um, And I think we're going to be left with the Cherokee question of how many came, and we're going to have to look at the treaty, I mean the uh, census of 1835, and then compare what rosters we have. But then from that point on, it's going to, we're going to have to look for other resources to, to do that. Now, why? Why was the government so intent on making the slaves part of the removal, and they were intent on that. And you see the logic when you look at these, these removal schedules. The government printed up the schedules, and here they had columns for slaves on there. They paid as much commutation money for slaves as they did for uh, Cherokee. They paid, it at, and this was true in all the tribes, they paid as much uh, they gave us the same rations to slaves as they gave to Indians. Um, why are they subsisting them if they didn't intend for them to come to the West? Um, in the Seminoles, the government refused to let slave claimers settle any accounts before they left the East. They said, take care of that in the West. Well, odds reduced greatly for them to be able to do that. But the slave traders did follow them to the West. Um, why did they allow the slave owners privileges? I mean, why were they so kind to these folks? And why was the federal government so intent with some of the tribes of documenting the bands to which they belonged? Now, first answer that comes up is it was more expedient to move the slaves to the West than try to take it away from them. Take them away from them. And that makes sense. But if they took the land away from the tribes, and we know the stories about how these non-Indians came in and took over people's property, stole property, personal property from them. Why did they not take the slaves? All of these tribes were surrounded by slave states or slave territories. But the slave hunters should have had a field there. But the government protected them from the slave hunters. Okay? If you're interpreting removal of African descended people with the tribes, why would you assume 
that removal was not as physically and culturally wrenching for the blacks as for the Indians. If they had to travel through the same landscapes, then why should they not be suffering the same kinds of exposure to the elements and so on? Well, one of the problems, I think, is that when we think about slavery, what comes to the minds of most people, and this is one of the reasons why I think this subject really needs to be interpreted. You say the tribes brought slaves with them. Most people are going to conjure up an image of plantation of blacks picking cotton. And that's not the way it was with the blacks that were with these tribes. Um, very few of tribal members practice plantation slavery. Very few. And what about these others who were listed as slaves? For the most part, those people were steeped in tribal culture. Many of those families, slave families, had been in those tribes since the 18th century. Well in the 18th century. Many of the blacks were proficient in the tribal language. Blacks became the favored translators and interpreters for some of the tribes. They trusted their interpretation more than they trusted white people's interpretations. And why was that? If the blacks didn't understand the language and the culture well enough to do the interpretation the way it should be done. And look at the missionary records. Now, I don't trust missionaries very much when it comes to giving us an accurate picture of uh, what's going on in tribal culture because every good missionary knew they were all pagans. Um, but, if you look at the history of early missions in the tribes, you'll find that the early conduits for the Christian method message was through the slaves, or through the free blacks. They used them as a way of getting at the Indian population. But why were they so susceptible to Christianity? And now I'm going to say something that you're going to think, this man has lost his mind. <laughs> I may have. <laughs> but if, what, this is an evidence of it, I guarantee you. The studies of slavery, and now this, you really don't think I'm crazy when I say Dan Littlefield has done a lot of that. Now I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about the other one. There are two of us. He's at the University of South Carolina. Problem was we were both at Johns Hopkins in the old Institute of Southern and Negro History. He left one week, I got there the next. That was confusing. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Aaron, you met Dan at to Cincinnati when we were up there. Yeah. But he, he has done a lot of slavery studies and people of his generation of slave studies have told us that about 20% of the slaves that came into the South in the 18th and 19th century, early 19th century, were Muslims. And now we know that if they came from West Africa, if they came from Ghana, Senegal, Mali, um, and Guinea, those countries, there's no way they could have escaped a Muslim influence because those countries had been Muslim since the 700s. So, whenever you're talking Christianity, if you if you've been steeped in Muslim country and, and all those Spaniards that came from Andalusia after 1492, Andalusia that was 1492 was when the Muslims were kicked out of Spain. So any of those that came from Andalusia as slaves of the Spanish that came to the New World, 
They certainly would have been Muslim. But you've got one God above all gods. You've got heaven and hell. You've got reward or punishment in the afterlife. Sounds familiar to me. And why would we think that if you had somebody that came was a Muslim and came over the Middle Passage that they would forget everything about their culture? Why would they not pass that on to another generation? We don't know how oral history works. Well, I don't know. Maybe that's far-fetched. But it may be worth thinking about. It might help explain some of those things that we can't explain. Because it was always phenomenal to the travelers in Indian country that these blacks could speak the language and that they were used as lay exhorters, you know? And there may have been a reason for that. Well, change the pace of this a little bit. If you're interested in doing research on the blacks who came with the tribes, you need to start looking at your courthouses because that's where you're going to find records, the names of blacks who made the trip. Um, I've looked at records in Montgomery County, Alabama. I've looked at records in Macon County, in Tuskegee. I've looked at records in Calhoun County, at Anniston. And I've found slave records made by the Creeks in all of those counties. So I know they're in the other counties too, where the records exist. In St. Clair County, Alabama, I've seen the same kind of records for the Cherokees. Now what a lot of these people did, went in, when, the, when the, the states carved counties out of the tribal territory to protect themselves and their property, and in many cases their families, they went in and recorded the slaves as property. But it was not their, it was in no way child slavery. It just didn't exist. And so they also bequeathed certain slaves to their children. And they listed other property. So you get a good sense of households by looking at these records. Now, if you're doing Chickasaws or if you're doing tribes in Alabama, be sure when you go into the courthouses that you look at the general series of records and you're going to find slave documents in the deeds. But in those two states, look in the orphan's court records because there's where the Indian records will be. Indians were not citizens. They were treated like minor children orphans. They had to have a, an agent or somebody who could file papers for them. And I know how this works because at St. Clair, I was looking at a document filed by one of my great great grandparents on this page of an orphan's court record and on this page was John Ridge filing a paper for Peggy Pathkiller listing her slaves. So I know those records because I have used them. And that's just a bit of research advice that you have. Um, Also, when you do research on African descended people in the tribes, you have to work with the understanding that the military people and agents who worked with the tribes didn't always know what they were looking at. So you're going to see all kinds of labels placed on people. It's sort of like uh, U.S. Census records. You know, you know, worked enough of those to know what they, how they label folks, but. You know, they'll, they'll have uh, Indians and Negroes, um, Indians and slaves. Sometimes they'll say Indian Negro. Now, you have to understand that Negro didn't mean ra uh, uh, a race. It didn't mean 
slave, it meant it was a color designation. And so you have to, to look at this language with some question. And in the Seminoles, it's really necessary that you do that. Because if they ask a, a black, to whom do you belong? And he might say, Mikolopi. So this guy would write down, slave of Mikolopi. But he didn't mean that Mikolopi had title to him. He meant he was a member of Mikolopi's band. And so you look at these lists of Seminole moving out, it looks like all of these band leaders are just these tremendous slaveholders. Now this seems strange in a society which didn't operate on a profit, profit motive, motive. And another thing you have to consider is that many of the slaveholders were women. This is in all tribes. When you go in these courthouses, you start looking at Indian documents related to slavery. I think you'll find most of the people filing those documents are women. Now, we know, for instance, that that issue became critical with Chickasaw removal because the federal government had said, we're going to dole out these allotments by head of household. And by that, the government meant a man. And so some of the culverts had several wives. So how do you, this guy ends up with allotments for all these households. And the Chickasaw leadership said, no, that's not how it works. It's the women who own the household. You need to redo this. And they re did redo it. The women were the ones who owned property. And they said, they don't, the children of one household doesn't consider the children of another household as kin because their fathers, even just because their father was the same, unless their mothers were sisters. So look at these designations of household, owner, slave, and all that with some critical eye. How am I doing for time? Keep it going. Yeah. <laughs> We've already had a lecture on people that went over time. <laughs> Okay, then, then I've still got to talk about the question of why. Why was the federal government so set on moving these people to the West? And, and with the Seminoles, they kept very accurate records on, on those. And they did that because they were prisoners of war. So but we know why those records are more complete than any other for any other tribe, as far as I know. Well, I think that the fact that what was going on nationally had a great deal to do with this at the time. You know, this is the period in which the debate was going on about, are we going to admit this state as a free state or a slave state? And what happened with Arkansas was it was admitted to as a state in 1836 because of removal. Uh, we didn't have any financial structure in the state, and so what was the equivalent of millions of dollars in those days flooding in because of removal. So Arkansas was given statehood at a time when it didn't have the population really to support statehood. Well, there was such a cry about the balance being on that the next year Michigan was introduced up, uh, in, uh, as a, a state. But then because Florida territory, we acquired that, that was still slave territory. Federal government had created another slave territory where you're standing, sitting right now, Indian territory. And of course, here the, you've got an imbalance again. Why was the government willing to take that chance again, see? But they, they wanted to do that. Um, then, what else was going on? Remember Jackson's concern about vulnerability? 
of the South. This is a period when there was a growing fear of slave rebellions. Jackson had been a part of the invasion of Florida in 1816 that destroyed the Negro Fort. There were 300 armed blacks on the Apalachicola in a fort. And he was part of the army that destroyed that because they were afraid that there would be some, it was still Spanish territory that they were in at that time, that there would be some spillover into the lower states. And then, 1831, now get your dates, your dates straight with your rule here, Nat Turner's rebellion in Virginia. And then how many of you know about the Mystic Rebellion of 1835? That's one that's gone over people's heads and I don't understand because people were hanged at Natchez and Memphis in 1835 because of slave rebellion called the Mystic Rebellion. Now, you can see why Jackson might be concerned about these armed blacks who had joined the Seminoles when the Seminoles began to rebel against removal. I mean, that could, that could really make the South become destabilized and vulnerable. And so he deeply believed that the United States was vulnerable. So you know the story about John Eaton, his first Secretary of War. John Eaton married that bar maid in Washington, D.C. and fell out of grace. Well, Jackson gave him a golden parachute, which was the governorship of Florida. When the Seminoles rebelled against removal, Eaton says to Jackson, send me regular troops, don't send me militia. Because if you send militia, it'll be a war of attrition. Jackson refused. He said, if I take troops, because there were very low uh, enlistments at that time, he says, if I take troops off the East Coast, and that's where I'll have to take them from, send them to Florida, that will make the East Coast vulnerable to invasion. I guess he didn't want the British in Boston Harbor again. Because, you know, he just remembered that from 1812. So, I think that fear of Jackson comes into play again with the determination to move those blacks out of Florida. And the blacks were used against the Seminoles to get them out of Florida. What Thomas Jessup did, Thomas Jessup was an unprincipled man as well. And all you gotta do is read a little bit of his life and know that. But what he did, he promised the blacks if they would separate from the Seminoles and remove, uh, uh, surrender, he would move them to the West as free people set them up in towns of their own and protect them. And of course they surrendered in droves. And what he was doing was separating the warriors because they had put a large number of warriors into the field against the militia. He was reducing the number of warriors available to the Seminoles and he was removing a supporting population among the Seminoles. And so those were sent to the West, and that's one reason why he documented those, the government documented those so well. Um, now, the slave hunters followed the Seminoles and, and Muscogee Creeks to the West. And those free blacks was a bone of contention between those two nations, two tribes, after removal. It took years for the two tribes to work that out. Meanwhile, you had all these slave hunters coming into Indian territory. Arkansas develops a slave trade, which it did not have before removal. Headquarters at Van Buren here in Fort Smith, there in Fort Smith. Um, and uh, 
and it was a viable slave trade, and they were focusing on the Indian Territory. So it had a lot to do with the economic development of this state, because this state had not been growing cotton, it had been growing corn and other foodstuffs for removal, livestock, so on. Now, the picture I see of these blacks who came to the West, that they were victims of government policy just like the tribes were. They were used as a, an excuse, political excuse, to get a policy in place that the government wanted in place. Now, I think nothing else. That earns them a place for interpretation about what happened in the wake of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Now, this is the question I put at the head of the talk I was going to get. Where do we go from here? I think that's up to us individually. Um, but um, when I talk to people, as I said at the beginning of this talk, yesterday and today, one thing that came up was the aging population of the Trail of Tears Association. You know, and what's the organization going to do? Is there life after the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail? I would suggest that some of the states look at what Bob and Annie Perry are doing at Tuscumbia with the Tuscumbia Landing Trust, developing curriculum materials. Until we get until we get material in writing that we can get into public schools, we're not going to have any change in the way removal is treated by teachers, because they're going to take the path of least resistance in some cases, because they're overworked and underpaid. So I, that's all I have to say. If we can help you in any way, get the research done that you're doing at the Sequoia National Research Center, please call on us. And by the way, the website that's on the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail is not a good one. Uh, it is um, uh, one that we have not used for six or seven years. And so I don't know if you can even get to it now. But we are uh, www.ualr dot edu slash sequoia and when you go in there on the left hand side menu you'll see a, a menu that says search catalog click on that you will go to a menu that says archives catalog library catalog those of you who have been going to Archives Catalog because you think that's where the records are, wrong. The <laughs> access to those records is the library catalog. So check on, check the library catalog. And thanks to the Oklahoma uh, uh, Trail of Tears Association uh, who donated so many records to us for this project, we now have those all cataloged. So if there's a name that shows up in one of those documents and you plug it in, it should give you not only the record, but it should give you a, a PDF of the document. So I think that'll be a big help. Thank you.